Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai hari mai, ko Charlotte Penton toko ingoa. Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar. My name is Charlotte Penton. I am a communications advisor at Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. This webinar today is part of our webinar series, which highlights tools and findings from our research. So today's webinar is about research from our Communicating Risk and Uncertainty project. So tools that can communicate a degree of risk and uncertainty associated with a particular decision are urgently needed, especially in marine management. And as highlighted in Dame Juliet Gerard's recent report into the future of commercial fishing, she wrote, and I quote, data, data, data. It is dark down there, but we must make decisions anyway. The report also calls for better data sharing to create new tools for better decision-making. And today you'll see an example of that. So speaking today is Dr. Fabrice Stevenson. Fabrice currently works at the Center for Coasts and Oceans at Niwa Hamilton, and is particularly interested in understanding spatial patterns of biodiversity for conservation and marine spatial planning. His research has been primarily on animals that live near or on the seafloor, but he has also worked on top predators such as whales, dolphins, and sharks. So here at Sustainable Seas, he is project co-leader of the Communicating Risk and Uncertainty Project, along with Joanne Ellis at Univer from University of Waikato. So this project is creating guidelines, models, and tools that explicitly identify risk and uncertainty to help make decision-making more inclusive and multi-sectorial. So while cetacean diversity hotspots are the focus of the webinar today, the methodology and resulting visualization tool is applicable not just to cetaceans, but other species and taxa as well. And just a quick note on the hotspots you'll see here today, they've been determined from the best available data that the modeling that Fabrice and the project team have done. So just to be clear, we're not the decision makers nor an advocacy, we are a research program. So just want to get that out there at the start. And we are all about providing the best possible information for better decision making for marine management. So I'll just go through a few logistics and then hand over to Fabrice. So Fabrice will speak for about 30 minutes and we will have a QA and a session at the end. So things are a little bit different with this webinar platform. We've now um, on Zoom webinars. So send your questions through the Q&A section, which is at the bottom of your screen, or at the end, raise your hand as you normally would, and I'll unmute you so you can ask Fabrice yourself. So just a quick note, you would have all seen that this webinar has been recorded and it will be made available online within 24 hours, along with the presentation slides and uh, additional resources. All right, so over to you, Fabrice. Thanks, Charlotte. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, thanks for that introduction and welcome everybody. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking a bit about um, cetacean conservation planning and how we can deal with some of the uncertainty and data gaps associated uh, with that. So before I get into uh, the bulk of my talk, uh, it's just a little bit of background around where this project came from. Um, so it was initially uh, some work that was funded by Fisheries New Zealand, and we used a lot of data from the Department of Conservation, and Martin Hawthorne and others. So I just want to uh, thank all those for providing uh, the raw biological data. Um, the second part of the research was funded by uh, Sustainable Seas Phase 2 Project 3.2, Communicating Risk and Uncertainty, uh, as well as uh, Project 1.2, Spatially Explicit uh, Cumulative Effect Tools. Um, the research is basically composed of two parts. And the second part was first presented at the Fifth World Conference on Marine Biodiversity in Auckland last year. And I'll be talking today, but I'll be talking on behalf of uh, many co-authors and collaborators uh, who are mentioned here at the bottom, who provide a lot of work and input at various times uh, throughout these uh, projects. So just a bit of overview. Um, I'll give a little bit of very brief background on cetacean distributions. Then I'll talk about uh, the approach that we used, which is uh, two parts. The first is uh, how we estimated the distribution of the cetacean taxa. And the second part is how we measured uncertainty in these distributions and how we use those to estimate hotspots. And so I'll kind of tie that together by discussing how we can account for some of this uncertainty and what generalizations we can make from this data, which is obviously applied to cetacean taxa, but could be applied to other uh, species and taxa as well. And we'll finish off with a, with a Q&A session. <clears throat> 
So as many of you will know, marine mammals play a key, a key role in many of the world's ecosystems, and they're important to people uh, for various reasons, including economic, cultural, social benefits that are often related to tourism uh, or recreational purposes. Um, but these species are thought to be critically at risk from human activities or human caused changes, things like climate change, pollution, over harvesting. And so that's really why uh, it's important to identify these cetacean hotspots if we want to have a think about how we might uh, conserve these important animals. Um, so I guess some of the problems really relate to how much information we have on these species. So for some species, we have lots of information. These are often uh, species that are coastal and accessible, things like bottlenose dolphins. But for many species, uh, we don't have much information on where they live, what they feed on. And this is either because of their behavior um, or because they live offshore where we have uh, less, less chances to observe them. And so this is highlighted in the IUCN red list um, where they characterized 40% of these as uh, of the species, cetacean species as data deficient. And for New Zealand, this is particularly important because our EZ is recognized uh, internationally as a cetacean diversity hotspot. We have 53% of the world's uh, known cetacean species, subspecies have been identified within the EZ. And similarly uh, to the kind of the international context, 28 of these species are considered data deficient within the uh, New Zealand EZ. And seven are also listed as endangered or critically endangered in this IUCN threat classification. So that really just uh, brings to light this need to identify cetacean hotspots for cons conservation management. And this was also identified uh, while we were setting up project 3.2. We did this uh, through a co-development process with our uh, co-developers from various institutes. And they identified that spatial tools uh, specifically with visualizations were important and useful for communicating the risk and the uncertainty. So this was a fantastic opportunity to take some work that had previously been uh, started by Fisheries New Zealand and apply that data in a context where we could explore some of the uh, risk and uncertainty and some of the trade-offs that might uh, happen with those. Um, so I guess I'll be talking about it uh, towards the end of the presentation, but uh, I think we can kind of uh, look at some of the tools that we're using today and think more broadly about how they can be generalized to other systems or other problems uh, and other management questions. So this is really just an overview and maybe the start of something. And that's maybe just worth bearing in mind uh, as, we go into the, as we go into the talk. So the approach for estimating our hotspots. Um, the first part is uh, how we came up with the distributions for the cetacean taxa. So there's a schematic here, which will show uh, the different processes. And this is from one of the papers and it's quite detailed with a lot of technical methodology, which I won't go into really today, but I just wanted to highlight that um, the kind of the detailed methods and further information are available in a publication in diversity and distributions which describes how we came out with uh, some of these um, distribution estimates. And then the second part will focus on how we take some of the uncertainty measures that we're aware of and combine them with those distribution uh, methods to come up with scenarios. And we're gonna explore scenarios. Um, uh, we're gonna explore a baseline scenario where um, we don't incorporate uncertainty at all. And then we're going to look at how different weighting of uncertainty can affect our final uh, uh, overview of the hotspots. And again, um, I don't want you to focus too much on the detail in here, uh, but if you are interested, there is also a publication there that uh, that will be out very shortly. So that's an overview of the approach. And now I'll give a little bit more detail about part one. So how we came up with the distribution uh, of cetacean taxa. So it started off with uh, figuring out uh, where these species were located within New Zealand. So we collated at sea sightings data for 30 uh, species, subspecies, and species complexes. And after the grooming, so tidying up of the data, we ended up with uh, 14,500 samples, which is a, a good amount of samples. Uh, we then um, decided to split our species into two categories, uh, species with high information and species with low information. And so we considered uh, any taxa with more than 50 sightings as high information, and those with fewer than 50s as low information. This is a bit of a, a subjective decision and it really relates to uh, what, how we can use those sightings for the modeling uh, rather than for any kind of conclusions on whether we know a lot or very little about uh, these individual taxa. 
And so what we can do is we can take this biological information and combine it with environmental variables that we think affect the distribution of these species. And in this case, we had 14 uh, environmental variables, spatial resolution of one kilometer for the whole of the EZ. And we can estimate the distribution uh, using species distribution models. So just a very quick sidebar for any of you who might not be familiar with species distribution modeling. It's where we take the presence and absence of a species. So if we assume that the red dots here are the presences and the crosses are the absences, we can look at where the location of the presences are in relation to environmental variables. And we might have several of these, and these are variables that we think affect the distribution. And from that, we get an understanding of where these species are likely to be, what environment they prefer. And we get these response curves, which we then use to transform the environmental predictors to predict our species distributions. So um, here's a table of our cetacean taxa for which we would consider we have a lot of information or more than 50 records, which isn't a lot, but this is for the modeling perspective, what we considered a reasonable number. Um, we can see here that I guess that there's uh, pilot whales, which are a species complex that compose the two species. And we also have Maui's and Hector's dolphins, which are subspecies, but we model them separately because they have relatively distinctive ranges and we have a lot of uh, samples and a lot of records for them. So we can see here that there's quite a range of uh, record uh, numbers for each of our taxa. Um, but for each of these taxa, we're able to use uh, flexible machine learning uh, modeling methodologies, SDMs, uh, which were these boosted regression trees. So I won't show all of the distributions, but here we have an example for common dolphin. Um, so we can see the distribution, the probability of seeing one of these uh, throughout the year in uh, dark red, uh, quite coastal species, and mainly uh, restricted to the North Island. Um, so we had a lot of records for this species, about four and a half thousand. And so using this, we're able to estimate some of these relationships with the environment. When we looked at how well the model worked, it had uh, very good, what we call predictive power. So the model was able to uh, estimate where these dolphins were very well. And associated with these, we also have spatial estimates of uncertainty. So we know where the model is uh, more or less certain uh, across space. And I'll show you an example of that in the next few slides. For the low information cetacean taxa, we didn't have enough uh, samples to do these boosted regression trees. We needed a bit more information. And so we took a different modeling uh, pathway. We decided to uh, use a mechanistic uh, method where we effectively estimate the relationship of the species with the environment. And the method we chose to use was this environmental, relative environmental suitability or RES. So we can see here that there's quite a lot of species or taxa with, with very few uh, records. And so um, that really was the reason why we decided to take an expert-based approach effectively, where experts estimated the relationships of these taxa with three environmental variables, sea surface temperature, water depth, and distance to shore. And what we effectively did was we generate an envelope. So we, we figure out um, which values are preferred by the taxa in terms of sea surface temperature. So it might be something like they prefer temperatures between 10 and 18 degrees and then their absolute maximum, which might be five to 25. And so through that, we get this uh, relationship where we uh, think we have an understanding of what they prefer in terms of sea surface temperature, water depth and distance to shore. And then we combine those uh, to come up with an estimate of where they're distributed across New Zealand. So here's an example of the distribution of the Southern right whale, dolphin, sorry, where we had 27 records. So it was actually the taxa where we had the most number of uh, records. And so this allowed us to uh, visually look at the distribution that we generated, where RES, where red was the highest value, so where we thought they were most likely to occur, and kind of compare it with uh, the location of our sightings, which are these uh, black dots here, as well as the location of strandings on the beach, uh, which are these uh, yellow triangles here. So it's quite a simple method. It relies on expert opinion and literature reviews. Uh, but visually, I think it more or less uh, or visually it looks like it might cover the broad niche and it's somewhat consistent with the sightings in the sense that the sightings are mainly in the red. Uh, we also have lots of red up here in the north where we don't have any sightings, but we do have a stranding. And so 
uh, from that, we, we, we would say that uh, although we don't have a lot of information, this is the best available estimate of the distribution here. And just a quick note, there's no estimate spatially of the uncertainty for these uh, modeling methods. So on that note, um, I'm just going to go through kind of some of the measures of uncertainty that we do have that are uh, available to us. So the first is the spatial estimates of uncertainty for the boosted regression tree models. So that's the species with lots of sightings. And here's an example for sperm whale where the red is where um, we have a lot of uncertainty, uh, quite a lot, 0.4. Uh, bearing in mind the scale here is 0 to 1. So uh, quite a lot of uncertainty in the offshore uh, for the predicted distributions of the sperm whale for this particular model. We also have an understanding of how well our samples cover uh, our study area, both geographically and in terms of the environment. I won't go into the details of how we came up with this. It's a separate model. But um, the takeaway message here is that uh, where we have red, we think we have a good understanding or we're more confident in our model predictions. And where we have blue, uh, we're very, uh, we have very few samples and we might be more cautious about the model uh, predictions. We also have an estimate of how realistic we think the models are. I use that term very loosely here. Um, and that's a measure of how well the model uh, fits are, uh, which we could measure with something like an area under the curve or other model metrics. But this is kind of, from a modeling point of view, our estimate of how certain we are that the model is doing what it should be doing. So that was a very brief overview of how we came up with um, the species distributions. Uh, when really what we're trying to get at is how we come up with these estimates of hotspots. So how we use these geographical predictions and the associated uncertainty measures to identify these hotspots. And to do this, we used two separate methods. Uh, the first was estimating cetacean richness within the EZ, and that's uh, simply a sum of all the species distributions. Uh, but this doesn't account necessarily for uh, representativeness or whether certain species that are very rare that might not overlap with some of the high richness areas. So to account for that, we did a spatial prioritization analysis using the software zonation, which does account for representativeness. So in this particular analysis, when it combines the spatial layers, it looks to find the smallest area uh, that will best represent the biodiversity and provides the maximum species representation. But it also accounts for these kind of rare overlapping spe uh, rare species that don't necessarily overlap uh, with other uh, species. And so with these two approaches, we increased the levels of uncertainty that we wanted to account for. And then we looked at how that affected the spatial pattern in the uh, distribution of our hotspots. So the first thing we did was to do the uh, baseline scenario. And this is uh, taking our data with our two different model types and combining them to look at uh, where the hotspots might be. And this was without accounting for any form of uncertainty. This is just using the raw distribution data and figuring out where the richest areas were and where the best areas for this spatial prioritization analysis would be. We then um, accounted for the uncertainty. And as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's quite a lot of methods heavy section in here. Um, so I won't go over that in detail. It is available in the paper if anybody's interested. But what we did do is we accounted for the uncertainty by weighting the models using uh, the model accuracy. So how well the models performed, the individual models, uh, the spatially explicit uncertainty that was available for the BRTs, and we downweighted the RES the models um, because we didn't have any spatially explicit uncertainty. And we also had this understanding of how well uh, or how many samples we had for each taxa and where those were located geographically. And so using that information, uh, we did a scenario with a moderate weighting of uncertainty, and then we did a scenario where we had a high weighting of uncertainty. So in terms of the uh, results for those, if we first look at the cetacean richness for the baseline scenario, so again, no incorporation of uncertainty. Um, there's a few patterns that emerge, but the major pattern really is that there's this high predicted richness in many parts of the offshore. Um, the highest richness that we had was 18, so that obviously shows that out of the 30 tacks that we had, uh, many of them aren't overlapping at all, and there's very few of these areas which have this high, high overlap. But most of the offshore had high richness. Uh, 
these are the results of the spatial prioritization where the red area here indicates the top 5% of the best 5% uh, across New Zealand where we would consider would be the most efficient uh, place to prioritize, say, putting a marine protected area. And there's a similar pattern here uh, where there's high areas of prioritization in many parts of the offshore that overlapped quite heavily with uh, some of the richness estimates. But equally, uh, most of the inshore was also identified as very important, and that's because it was accounting for uh, some of the taxa with restricted ranges like the hectares and Maui dolphins that don't necessarily overlap a lot with some of the other uh, taxa. So I won't really be going into the species that are contributing to those patterns, but they are available in that, in that publication if anybody is more interested in drilling down into some of the drivers of this. I'll be talking just more broadly about the uh, patterns as a whole. So um, now we've looked at this uh, baseline scenario and we get a feel for where some of these important areas may be. Uh, the next step was to incorporate that uncertainty into these two uh, scenarios, moderate and high uncertainty. Uh, so this figure shows the cetacean richness for the baseline at the top, uh, the moderate uncertainty scenario in the middle, and then the high uncertainty at the bottom. So as we move down this figure here, there's a higher weighting of the uncertainty in the analysis. And so what we can see, first of all, is that there's a shift uh, from the offshore uh, into the inshore, or rather the highest values are kind of more prominent in the inshore areas as we incorporate the uncertainty more and more strongly. There are still many offshore areas uh, that remain important across the scenarios. And just to kind of point out at this stage that the weighting that we used is somewhat subjective. We chose a kind of a moderate amount and then a very high amount to show the differences. Uh, and the reason why we're doing this is so that we can um, pull out kind of uh, overview generalizations effectively, which will help with some of the decision making. And I'll talk about that in the next few slides. But I just wanted to point out at this stage that uh, the weighting of that uncertainty might actually be a decision that would be uh, better placed for uh, stakeholders as part of a co-developed process. So this is more of an illustration of the kind of results that uh, might be useful for EBM or other uh, spatial conservation management. Okay. In terms of the uh, in terms of the spatial prioritization, uh, again we have the baseline at the top and then an increasing amount of uncertainty for the other two scenarios. We get a similar pattern to that observed for the richness. Um, we get kind of the offshore moving inshore. Um, in contrast to the richness, the certain parts of the inshore, uh, it's not great to see it in this figure, but most of uh, the inshore in the South Island and then the North North Island uh, were highlighted as a priority across, across the scenarios. So what kind of conclusions can we draw from um, some of these results? This is really the important bit that allows us to make uh, some of these overarching conclusions. So in this, in this um, uncertainty trade-off space, we're always looking uh, to evaluate how, uh, how much weight we put on the biological value. So this is where we think some of these important hotspots might be versus how much certainty we have in, uh, in the data. And so um, when we have areas that we don't think are very important biologically, so they will have low richness, for example, and they have low uncertainty, uh, we would consider these areas the least important. So we're very certain that these are not particularly good areas if we were looking to uh, prioritize conservation efforts. In contrast to that, if we have areas that we think are very important biologically, so they might have high richness or very uh, or species with restricted ranges that only occur in certain parts, and we have low uncertainty, again, these would be our most important areas. And so even as we increase the weighting of our uncertainty, these areas will still remain important and be highlighted. And I'll show some examples of this in the next uh, few slides. If we have areas that we think have high biological value, so they might have a high predicted richness, but we're highly uncertain on them, we have this potential for negative surprises. And so this is where, for example, if 
uh, a marine protected area was put somewhere where we think there's a lot of cetacean diversity, but our models were wrong, then we might not be protecting anywhere that's uh, particularly efficient. We might be missing areas that have a better return for conservation. So these are really areas that we're actually trying to highlight in this kind of analysis to avoid. Uh, and I'll show a few examples of that as well. And finally, we have these areas that we might consider are moderately important. They might have low or, or moderate biological value um, and high uncertainty. And so in this case, uh, we might be getting a better return than what we might be uh, estimating, but it's a little bit risky to, to uh, consider these areas too strongly or further work is usually recommended rather than uh, kind of making any decisions on those. So a few examples of some of these, uh, some of these places. So there were hotspots that were identified across scenarios and particularly in the offshore. Um, I'm showing here the, uh, the richness estimate with the highest accounting for uncertainty because the patterns are easier to see in this, but uh, there were certain parts of this that were highlighted as important throughout the scenarios. Places like the Low Coval Ridge and the Kermadec Ridge, Macquarie Ridge. Uh, these are the ridges up in the Kermadecs and then also down uh, south here. And then the western edges of the Bounty, uh, the bounty Trough down in uh, this section here, which also leads on to the Chatham Rise, which is also highlighted as important across the scenarios. So these are offshore areas that were kind of highlighted as important uh, throughout the scenarios. And so these are, um, you know, in many cases are, would be highlighted as really important. They have high biological value, and we're relatively certain that these uh, are, up, well, the, the estimates that we have are, up, are the highest that we can get. And so I guess for um, some of these places, it's important to note that there's actually not that much independent data that can uh, validate this. There's some anecdotal information. Potentially we could use things like historical whaling record data to uh, also kind of estimate whether these areas uh, are important for cetacean diversity. Um, but what it does highlight is that uh, this would be a good place to maybe do some more surveys. Certainly, if there were any kind of management decisions happening around this, it would be useful to kind of validate some of these offshore areas. Uh, but there were certain places inshore that were also highlighted as important throughout the scenarios, places like Kaikoura, East and North Cape, which we can see in here, are always kind of highlighted as these really important areas uh, where we do actually have quite a lot of information to uh, kind of corroborate the fact that these are important areas for cetacean diversity. From the spatial prioritization analysis, the inshore was uh, highlighted as important throughout the scenarios. So from that, we can gather that there's certain taxa uh, that have restricted ranges uh, and that would be important to protect if we wanted to represent all of the cetacean diversity uh, within New Zealand. Similarly, for the spatial prioritization, there were certain hotspots identified offshore again the same places were also coming through as um, being identified as important, uh, as well as kind of that in those inshore areas, Kaikoura and East North Cape as well, coming out uh, as important, very important in there. So in terms of the potential for negative surprises, um, if we compare here for the spatial prioritization, the baseline versus uh, the high uncertainty estimate. We can see here that these quite large differences, especially in these offshore areas that disappear as we incorporate more and more of the uncertainty in our solutions. Um, and so these large parts of the offshore were originally driven by these rare species. So we have lots of uh, rare species that we think use the offshore, but we're actually quite uncertain about it. And so um, if we incorporate the uncertainty very strongly, then we get these areas which um, will still potentially represent those, uh, but to a certain extent, maybe less efficiently, but we're more certain about it. So there is going to always be this uh, trade-off and discussion around how we best incorporate the weighting of the uncertainty. And I guess this just highlights here that some of these areas where we do have very little information, but might be important, could, could be highlighted through this kind of a, an analysis. Uh, and similarly, there's kind of these moderately important areas which uh, for, say, the richness uh, have a moderate level of richness. But because we're very certain in that, 
they become more and more obvious uh, in the visualization. You'll notice here that the richness here has a much lower unit than here. This is relative because of the way that we're discounting the uncertainty. What it does mean is that this uh, nine here might still be a nine in there. And so the actual values haven't changed. It's just how we visualize those uh, has changed. And a lot of these areas like the Cook Strait, the Kermit X, a lot of the Gulf, Hauraki Gulf, and uh, many of the inshore areas kind of become more obviously important uh, for uh, diversity, especially with some of the richness as we account for more and more uncertainty. So um, some of the conclusions from this work. So conservation planning is at least a part of EBM. It's an important part of EBM. And there's always going to be uncertainty associated with uh, the decision-making process. And especially with species distribution data, it's always going to be uh, very difficult to get an estimate of that with a lot of certainty. So we do need to think about solutions uh, that can accommodate that uncertainty uh, for spatial management. And our approach here does account for some of that. It accounts for various levels of spatial uncertainty. Um, we used uh, data from different sources. Some would call that opportunistic data, but it allowed us to include uh, rare species in our analysis, which is often and um, which is not often um, done. And we looked at two measures uh, and compared them. So we looked at how richness would represent these diversity hotspots and how uh, a spatial prioritization would. And actually, these are quite complementary measures. In most cases, uh, they were very similar, but in some cases, they were a little different. And this allows us to tease apart what might be important from a decision making point of view. And as I mentioned earlier, it allows us to incorporate data from different sources, uh, which is going to be increasingly important um, if we're trying to estimate distributions for lots and lots of species. So this is part of the work that we're doing um, for Sustainable Seas Project 3.2, Communicating Risk and Uncertainty. And I guess this could be seen as a first step for exploring some of these methods and how that would then feed into uh, a risk assessment. So the next step for this would be really about um, having managers, decision makers and co-developers come together to discuss some of the decisions that were made that were somewhat subjective uh, and kind of discuss the importance of some of the taxa and um, have a think about how that would feed into a risk assessment and what the appetite for risk is when it comes to decision making. The other thing is we used uh, citations here as an example, uh, and this allows us to make some generalizations. It's a, an example case study, if you like. This could be brought out to lots and lots of other taxa if we have that spatial information for them. Uh, I guess it could also be used for other types of management questions uh, or as a subcomponent of uh, other types of uh, spatial management decision making. So uh, that's, uh, here's some of the resources that are available if anybody wants any further information. I might have gone a little quick on some of that. So if there are any uh, bits that I missed, you could either uh, look it up in these publications or the conference poster that's available at the link, or we could have uh, a bit of a longer uh, Q&A session. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much, Fabrice. That, um... You delved into some, some pretty big methodology. I'm going to kickstart off the Q&A session with a question about EBM. You mentioned it at the end of your talk, and I just wanted to know if you could clarify how this tool can be used in an EBM approach, and if you have any thoughts on that. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Charlotte. So I kind of mentioned it, um, at the final couple of slides, but um, I guess this is a starting point. And as I mentioned in the talk, there's a few decisions that are somewhat subjective around how much uncertainty we need to wait. So I guess this is the first component that would be uh, kind of brought maybe to uh, co-development meeting as a straw man to kind of illustrate where the process might be going. And then following on from that, I guess there'd be more engagement required to come up with some of the decisions that uh, we made 
for the case study purpose. And then uh, following that, um, we might have an idea of uh, the distribution of where some of these places are that are important. And that would form one component of the EBM process, because I guess there's lots of other uh, important aspects uh, to EBM other than just the distribution of important species. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you for sort of talking about using how to actually use, I guess, those maps, those visualizations in, in those meetings and those conversations with stakeholders. So thank you. Um, first question is from Arnold. Uh, very interesting talk, Fabrice. One question. What is the model accuracy metric you used when estimating hotspots? Uh, thanks, Arno. Um, so uh, off the top of my head, I think we used, we must have used area under the curve, AUC, and it was, we did a transformation to it to spread out the values, so we squared it. But we could have used other estimates. We did also have true skill statistic and some other things available to us. I guess there is always issues with uh, using some of these uh, accuracy measures because they're only really measuring how well the model is doing, which might not reflect uh, what's really happening. So uh, that's kind of delving into deep uncertainty. It's we've, At least we have a, an estimate of the uncertainty that we know about, and there will always be uncertainty that we don't know about. And uh, we don't really get into that too much in this particular case study. I'm not sure if I answered the question. Maybe I <laughs> threw out some more questions and required. Uh, we don't have any questions coming through on the Q&A section. Um, oh, Anor has another question. Shall I unmute you, Anno? Okay, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was also wondering um, when you estimated um, hotspots, so there was um, this metric of species richness where you, you say you summed you summed the uh, individual distribution. So did you actually just uh, make a sum of the probabilities of um, occurrence? Yeah, yes, that's exactly right. Um, because these, yes, that's what we did. Um, and then the way we accounted for the uncertainty was we did a, a discounting. So once we'd accounted, once we, once we figured out how certain we are in various parts, we took that, subtracted that away from our estimates of the hotspots. And so that's why the numbers are getting smaller. Um, so that's a measure. Yeah, yeah, I'm asking because I, I um, you know, traditionally when you think about hotspots, you decide of a threshold value, you know, to convert your um, probabilities of occurrences into zeros and ones. So it, it could be, you know, the mean value over the entire domain, for instance. So is there a specific reason why you didn't use this kind of threshold values, like something in the literature that uh, advised against the use of thresholds? Or what, what is the rationale for um, simply summing over the probabilities of occurrence of the individual species? Yeah, there's, I guess there's several ways that you could come up with this estimate of richness. Um, and I, I have done both in the past for various reasons. But in this particular case, we followed some recommendations from a paper by Calabresi et al. 2014. I can send you, I can send you the reference. Um, and they recommended that they did some simulations and they looked at some macroecological models and they said that summing the occurrence was just as good as any other method, if not um, slightly better. So that's the reason why we decided to do the, the summing rather than a threshold approach. Thank you, Fabrice. Thank you, Fabrice and Arnold. Next question is, um, I'm going to hand over to Kath to ask a question and then I'll go to the Q&A answer oh. section after Kath. 
So, Kath, you can talk now. Kath, you will just need to unmute yourself. Okay, you can go. you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Oh, great. Um, thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Fabrice. Uh, Kath Large here, Dragonfly Data Science. Um, I really liked this talk and presentation, uh, Fabrice, and I just have a quick question and it's probably something that you might not be able to answer now, but are you planning on extending this particular case study um, through this work? And are you also planning to incorporate um, maybe another species group in a future case study. Um, I think there's a lot of, um, apart from the really interesting modeling technicalities um, here, I think there's really um, great facility for this work, like you say, for promoting discussions among stakeholders, um, especially in these highly contestable um, arenas for protected species. So I'm really interested to see this work. I might give you a call about it later, Fabrice, but um, yeah, are you planning to extend this work for other species? Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Kath. Yeah, happy happy to um, chat in more detail uh, later. Um, in answer to your question, I guess not really for uh, this, um, side of things within sustainable seas, we're um, kind of taking a broader view on things. So um, we might have to use some of this information in other ways, but um, it's more just kind of like a proof of concept, I guess. We are doing similar things in other um, projects, uh, which, you know, will benefit from this, but I'm not sure that there's plans to roll it out to, to more species as such, but um, uh, may maybe, maybe. It's still unsure, still unclear, maybe. Okay, thank you. Right, thanks, Kath. Next question is from Quentin Davies. Very interesting, Fabrice. Where can we access the modelling results? Your paper refers to NABIS, but I can't see the results on NABIS. Yeah, th thanks, Quentin. Um, yeah, they're not on Mavis. I think they were having a, a revamp at the time. I'm not sure if they've made it on yet. Uh, if anybody wants the uh, raster raw kind of prediction data, I have sent it out to people in the past. Uh, so I'd be happy to do that. If you just get in touch with me, send me an email, I'll send you, I can give you a link to the data. Awesome. We should probably get that amended in the paper actually. Thanks, Fabrice. Uh, and on that note, I'll um, make sure that Fabrice's contact details, uh, email address is um, part of, uh, included in the slides and at the end in the wrap up. All right. Um, next question is from Donna Cameron. How much time and or resources do you estimate it will take to gather enough data to remove some of the uncertainty? Thanks, Donna. That's a really good question. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of layers to that question actually. Um, so I'm just trying to think about how I can uh, how I can answer. I guess it depends what kind of uncertainty we're talking about. If it's about the model uncertainty, then for certain taxa, kind of targeted surveys to try and collect some more occurrence data would probably be uh, the best kind of solution. And so that would require people to kind of prioritize which of the taxa uh, they might consider are most important. Uh, and then from there, kind of surveys can be designed to try and target them. Um, how much time and how many resources? That's kind of a question, uh, you know, how long is a piece of string? It could be, it could be endless. Um, so I guess it would be about thinking about which species are the most important, what kind of type of uncertainty you want to reduce and then um, trying to uh, figure that out. I guess some of those offshore hotspots might be a good way forward. Um, kind of identified those places as important, but we don't have a lot of data. So maybe a bit more data in those places. Um, yes. So I'm not sure I've answered your question, but uh, if you have a follow up uh, with a bit more detail, maybe I can have a go. Okay, I'll wait, I'll give you a few more minutes to send your questions in. Um, um, and in the meantime, um, 
we can just wait for a little bit. I don't have any questions for Fabrice. So if anyone has any questions, can they quickly uh, put their hand up just so I know that there are questions coming? Oh, thanks, Donna. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. So I'll start to wrap up. Um, in terms of sending out the recording um, tomorrow, I will also include Fabrice's email so that anyone can forward their questions onto Fabrice and, and talk to him more about this research. Um, so thank you all for being here and thank you Fabrice for putting in the work. Oh, and <laughs> of course there is a question from Michael Donahue. How much harder would it be to estimate cetacean distribution across a much bigger area like the Pacific Islands? That's just another good question, uh, Michael. Um, it wouldn't be much harder. It would be it would take a little bit of time. So certain uh, certain Pacific Islands have lots of very good information on uh, occurrence records uh, for cetaceans. I know that. Um, Solen Delville did a lot of uh, really good stuff in New Caledonia and some of the other um, islands there, around there. Um, so it would be a question of bringing together that occurrence data and then rerunning the models, which, which wouldn't take a huge amount of time. Uh, there might, we might increase the uncertainty because certain Pacific islands might have uh, less data or the models might not work as well for their kind of as we increase the area, we might uh, we might not be able to understand the relationships as well as we have for New Zealand, where we have, relatively speaking, a lot of information. Um, so there might be a few little tricky things about how we account for that uncertainty, but it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be anything that I don't think we'd be able to tackle. So it wouldn't be necessarily harder. Um, again, uh, maybe just a few more resources, and then uh, yeah, I think it, it, it could be doable. Awesome, thanks Fabrice. Okay, final call, um, please uh, send in your questions ASAP. I'll give you 10 seconds and then we'll wrap up. Okay, so I will start to uh, I will wrap up this webinar now. Um, and as, as I've already mentioned, I will make sure that you can ask Fabrice questions, uh, follow up questions after this. Uh, so again, thank you very much Fabrice and thank you everyone for coming along. Really appreciate um, your appearances. And um, just a, a note about our next webinar uh, coming up on the 20th of May. Um, it is, I'm just reminding myself, the name is called Shady Business, the Problem of Mud in Our Estuaries. So that is on Tuesday, the 20th of May at 11 a.m. And Conrad Pilditch, Simon Thrush, Kuda Paul Burke and Megan Carbines will be talking about, just will be discuss, discussing the effects of um, sediments on estuary ecosystems and discussing future management strategies. So um, I will include a link to that webinar in, our, in the follow-up. So just reminding you, the recording will be made available online within 24 hours. And thank you all again. Bye.